teach at Cal State LA. I run the Child Abuse and Family Violence Institute there, and I run a certificate program which is largely for undergraduate students who want to have uh, essentially a minor, you know, listed on their transcripts for involvement in uh, child abuse and family violence. And I teach them about interviewing, and I teach them about the system. And many of them want to become children's services workers, probation officers, and work at the court. And they have their field placement at the juvenile dependency court. So that's what I do full time during the day. And uh, the other things that we're involved in is we're involved in a partnership with our juvenile court. We have a lot of research projects going there. And we also put on a conference once a year with the juvenile court. You may have heard about it. We call it the Herschel Swinger Memorial Conference, and it is at Cal State LA. And we have had it in September, but we're going to move it to March of uh, 2017 to accommodate our schedule and change into semesters, which is a whole other story. So let's talk about the presentation today. So the name I selected for this, which is Moving Beyond Bullying to Peer Aggression and Victimization, is what I want to focus on today. And I want to give a little bit of an acknowledgement to my partner in crime, so to speak here, which is David Finkelhor. And you may have heard his name before. Um, he gave this presentation with me at the American Professional Society on the Abuse of Children this summer. So some of this material I want to credit is his. And when I get to the research about children's exposure to violence, his organization conducted that. Okay. So with that, I usually typically do an overview. Um, so my overview is going to be, we're going to look at the current concept of bullying and what are the problems with that. And then I'm going to take it immediately. I think it's really important to think about what the child's point of view is. So I have a clip that I saved from YouTube that I think you're going to find very interesting. I look at it every time that I do a presentation and I find something new about it. Um, so we'll show that and then we'll look at what are the implications of, you know, what are kids asking us as adults to do for them and how seriously do they see this problem. Then I'm going to look at uh, the relationship between peer victimization and intrafamilial child maltreatment because there's been some recent research that came out just last year looking at the seriousness of peer victimization when you stack it up against child maltreatment and I think it may surprise a lot of you here. Uh, then we'll look at uh, this new stance we're taking. You know, it's somewhat unpopular. But new stances sometimes do start out being unpopular. So it's not, um, it's not that uncomfortable to be in that spot, but I'd like to get your reaction to it. And I'll shorten it so we can actually have some discussion, because part of the value of me coming here is getting your reaction to this uh, stance that we're saying about, what do you think we can do differently if we do change the concept of referring to this phenomenon instead of calling it bullying, to call it peer victimization and aggression? And what if the schools actually had an ability to report it to DCFS or for Children's Protective Services? And why would that be necessary? So hold that thought and we'll do our exploration. Okay, so originally this concept was designed by a guy by the name of Dan Oveas. And he did the pioneering work in this, and we're very much indebted to him in the 60s. And he came up with this concept that has stuck. And it was just originally his hypothesis. He said, how am I going to quantify and describe bullying? So he came up with these two features, repeated activities and a power imbalance between the parties. And it served uh, the research community well for several years. And then we got into very difficult territory because it's much more than that. There are a lot of things that happen to kids that are much farther beyond just repeated activities where there's a power imbalance. And I want to point out, power imbalances are very difficult to describe. Because when you think of a power imbalance, you think of, first of all, you think of size. But in this room, I know people, people know that you know, two chronologically same aged kids are not necessarily equal in their intellectual ability. They're not necessarily equal in perhaps their cognitive skills. They're also perhaps not equal in the non-cognitive skills, which are really important for social, uh, getting along socially, the non-cognitive skills. And the other thing is this really breaks our heart because many times these are our own kids that we love 
we see their uniqueness, we see their gifts, we see how they're different and we appreciate them and we delight in their uniqueness. But what this says to a bully or a person who's planning on doing some peer victimization and aggression, this says, easy target, come and get me. And that's the tragedy of it. So problems with the concept, I already said that, you know, it's just a hypothesis that Oveus made up many years ago. It hasn't actually been proven, nor do we think we have enough research to really differentiate what is really serious versus bullying light, and that'll be important in a few minutes. And there's a lot of fragmentation around this, around people who are starting to think, oh, this is much more serious than we ever thought that it was. And here's another concept that is really important. Um, it excludes a lot of one-time activity. So if, it's, if we go by repeated activity, what happens if this is a date rape? Or what if there's some sort of targeted sexual harassment one time? What if there's gang activity at school targeting a particular kid? Well, it's not repeated, so many schools would say, don't worry, that's not bullying. But it could be. And I submit that it's beyond bullying, that it really is peer aggression and victimization. So another problem is it's hard to define, as I hope I laid that out. It's used differentially by researchers and children. You're gonna see in a moment, kids define it differently than researchers do, and so there's a lot of fragmentation going on. So I'm hoping that we could adopt the name of peer victimization and aggression so that we could be more uniform in our collecting of data and perhaps be more helpful to kids. Okay, so what do kids think? Well, for this I had to go back a few years back and I say, you know, a few years. So it started, this is some research the Kaiser Family Foundation did in 2015. And although it may be about 15 years old, it's still very useful. And before I got into peer aggression and victimization as a part of my work, when I put this screen up and when I first looked at it, I would have ranked what kids think as the tough issues very differently than they do. Now you can see it, I gave you the answers, but when I do it in a pretest and people don't know exactly what I'm gonna be speaking about, they rank this completely differently than how kids ranked it. And an important piece about this research is that it oversampled for Latino kids and African American kids just so their voice could definitely be included. And look how they ranked it. So they ranked teasing and bullying as their number one problem ahead of issues with drugs, issues with sex, issues with discrimination came next. But this is very heartening to know that this is a kid's number one problem. The other piece is on here, and I'm gonna take a moment to pull up this clip, but before I get to the one I'm pulling up, I have two on here. I have, the first one is from the Bully documentary. Now that was out two years ago. Did anybody here see the Bully documentary? It was actually quite good. It's a story of a young man by the name of Alex Libby, and he was tormented at his um, middle school, and this documentary is excellent because it shows the mom trying to do something and going to the school, and the school is saying, essentially, they're there. You know, I've ridden that bus before. It really isn't that bad. When there was documentary footage of people stabbing this young man with their pens and, and kicking him down the aisle, it's very interesting. And this little clip that I have here, if you ever want to use it, it's about Alex being interviewed by Katie Couric and also the producer of the video, so it's very inspirational. But we're not gonna do that today. The second thing we're gonna do is, I hope we'll really engage you in the Fine Brothers presentation of what kids think about bullying. It's called Kids React to Bullying. And while I get it up here, I have to uh, do some maneuvering to pull it up. I want you to be thinking about what are these kids asking us adults to do? What are they asking us to do and what do you think we can do? And I want you to appreciate the range of kids they selected here, the Fine Brothers, really articulate kids. There's a lot of wisdom. Every time I show it, people say, oh, wow. Um, but what the, the setup is that they showed an actual clip of real bullying to this set of about 15 youngsters and then each one of them is reacting to it individually. And you could hear off camera the interviewer asking 
um, the, the young people to react and tell us what their thoughts are. So let me pull it up for you in a second here. Just Sad, bro. This can't be good. Hey guys, just keep recording. Oh, jeez. Oh my god. That was bad. That was some pretty serious bullying. So you talk about what's happening in the video? Bullying. This little short kid was bullying this big kid. He kept punching him, and then the Duke finally said, okay, I'm done with you, and he picked him up, just threw him down. Boom, like that. That, that was scary. <laughs> oh my god, that was good self-defense, but still. That's very inspirational, like, for people who have bullies and they watch this video. What about the kid that was filming it? Terrible. Why, why did they videotape it? They think it's cool and that it's funny and that... Ooh, I'm gonna get millions of views off this. So the story was the bigger kid was being bullied for a while by the smaller kid, and this was the first time he ever fought back. Do you think it's good that he did? No. No? Not really. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah. Yeah? It's kind of a trick question. Why is it good? Because he needed to defend himself. Because if this kid punches him, he has the right to punch him ten times harder. I think a kid should be able to fight back if somebody is really not stopping and not leaving them alone. I think you actually should fight back. And if it doesn't work fighting back, maybe, I know this is huge, but transfer schools. And why do you think that he shouldn't fight back? He's supposed to tell a teacher. I mean, tell the principal. Tell someone. Because they, now they're both at fault. But if you got an adult, it would have been just the other guy at fault. Because if you fight back, then you're also kind of a bully because you're hurting him, he's hurting you. And what is bullying? It's a terrible thing. It's a very bad thing. There's a lot of it right now. Punch, kick, smack, uh, Reggie. Look at this kid, look at the shirt he's wearing, look at his shoes, and they like make fun of your clothes and how you look. A thing that people do to you when you're weak, not strong, and when you're littler than them. They try to make you feel less about yourself so they can feel better about themselves. Why do you think that people become bullies? They were just born mean. People are just mean, hard-headed. I mean, it's crazy, but people think that they could become more popular by picking on kids at a lower level than they are. Because maybe they used to be bullied. Sometimes, like, they come from broken homes. Here's the kid with nobody to talk to. And he just thinks he could roam free and do whatever he wants. There's nobody there to tell them that it's wrong, except for the teachers who, who don't even see them that much. Have you ever been bullied? I've gotten bullied before. I have. Not physically, but yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Oh, sure. One time these six years picked on me. Every time someone says something bad to me, now I just say, oh, thanks, you too, have a nice day. And I walk away and they're all like, wait, what? When I was in the third grade, there was this kid, and he was like really picking on me just because, I don't know why, it just amused him for some reason to, you know, like call me names and just push me around. He like kind of like hit me and then I punched him right in the face and knocked him out. It took me a year to do it, <laughs> so I endured a year of constant pain. If this was happening at your school in the video and you came across it, what do you think you would have done? Yell at them, say stop, get a teacher. I would have gone in between them and said stop, you guys stop. Seriously, this doesn't need to happen. I will try to stop it or I go tell the teacher. People can call me a tattletale, but I'm actually trying to stop it. What do other kids do usually when they see other kids being bullied? Get out their phones and start recording. Some people don't even do anything. A lot of kids just stand there and think it's amusing. Like it's a real life movie or something. Run away or go get a teacher if they're brave enough. Why is that a brave thing? Because then if they don't get expelled, they can always come back and start bullying you. Bystanders who just like stayed there, they're actually bullying them too because they're not going to get help. You've heard of cyberbullying? Yeah. And what is that? The modern version of bullying. Bullying people through typing. It's more verbal, but people don't realize that verbal is actually bigger. It could be bigger than actually fighting. There could be the nicest person in the world and online he could be the meanest person because Online, you're completely anonymous. Pretend 
I'm on Facebook and someone calls me something bad like you're ugly. If you know anyone from any other state, they're gonna find out too and then they're gonna tell their friends and then their friends are gonna tell their friends. It's like a virus spreading across the world. You post like the, maybe one of their secrets and you make them depressed and that's how a lot of kids commit suicide. How can you help stop cyberbullying? Parents should be making sure you're not on Facebook messaging people, hey, I hate you, I wanna kill you and all this stuff. Most of the parents don't even know that they're doing it. The adults downstairs cooking dinner and you're upstairs doing all of this bad stuff and they don't and they don't ever find out about it. And is that the same as regular bullying? Is it worse? Is it better? It's actually kinda worse. One tease eventually goes away. Cyberbullying, it never goes off the internet and it's continuous throughout the rest of time. If you bully them there and someplace else, it just makes them feel like they can't get away from it. What does your school do to educate you guys about bullying? Assemblies. The there was an assembly last year. Everyone was crying after it because it was so like powerful, but nobody got the message. We've had a paper that we had to sign to make sure that no one that if we bullied we'd have punishment for it. And does that work? No. So all we really need to do is use our cool tools. What are cool tools? I don't like it when you punch me. Oh, okay, let's make up. And they think that's just how it works. What more do you think schools should be doing to stop bullying? Some really, really strict person can tell them to stop. Maybe come to our classes and talk to us individually. You get three warnings. First warning, you get detention or something. Second, you get suspended. And third, you get expulsion or something. They should have cameras looking at security guard. Maybe teachers coming out during recess and lunch. Talk to the parents. If they're the parent of the bully, they've they can stop it. I would hope that they would talk to them about it and not just go, okay, we'll keep an eye on him, because that's not gonna, they don't have an extra eye to watch someone or something. I'd have to think about it for a while because I don't know if there's anything they could really do besides add a hundred more aides and watch every single kid in the school. So what ended up happening here was the school suspended the bully for 21 days and suspended the kid being bullied for four days. Do you think that's fair? Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. I think the kid that was bullying the other kid maybe should have been expelled or suspended a little longer. One less bully is one less more bullies because you know what? Bullies can cause bullies. They suspended him for 21 days is that enough? Adults get sent to jail for just for that, but kids, they only get off of school for, for a couple of days. I think they should maybe be sent to juvie for a couple of months. And do you think bullying will ever completely go away? Hopefully, yes, but I don't know. I don't think so. No. Because there's war and stuff. War takes a thousand men. That's basically bullying. What would you say to the kid that was getting picked on if you could talk to him? Good job, rather than just sitting there and being bullied. Good job. Do not fight back, okay? Okay? Next time that happens, call me. You know, I'll help you out. And what do you want to say to all the bullies of the world? Why? That's all I have to say, why? People who bully, don't do it anymore. If you have problems, you need to solve them. Why do you want to hurt someone so bad? What if you were them? Family might be dysfunctional, but everything should be okay when you go to school. That should be your happy place. You shouldn't be picking on other people. Violence is never the answer. Just treat people like you want to be treated. Do not do it. You are bad. Terrible. I cannot even look at you. So, um, let me ask you, what do you think these kids are asking us to do? Yes. Um, I think the kids are, I think the kids are asking us to be careful what you say to others because it might seem like bullying, or if it is bullying. Um, there are a lot of sensitive people out there, and they don't know, probably don't know what to do. They might end up not going to school for months or weeks just because of just one small action that you might think is small is actually much bigger to that person. That's true because there is, later on in the presentation, I'm gonna talk to you about some of the effects, the outcomes are school, high school absenteeism. And it's very traumatic for kids. Anybody else, the, what do you think kids are asking us to do? What are grown-ups? What are they saying? If this was on a committee... They, they mentioned, several of them mentioned paying attention. Being paying attention. So that as adults we can step in when we see something versus not being available. True. So they're asking us to intervene. They're asking for more teacher time. And you had something back here. They're asking us to role model. They don't know how to solve the problem. Yes. They don't. They're, you know, they're, sh they're shooting at it, and they have several good ideas, which involve 
more adult time, paying attention, more aids, going to the parents, and we're gonna see in a moment in terms of the research, we do have to go to the parents because we have to make the parents responsible, at least involve them in it. The paradox is bully parents don't wanna be involved. They don't think their kid's doing anything like that kid said. <laughs> they're downstairs and their kid's doing all this bad stuff and they're oblivious and they don't think it's happening even when the evidence is presented to them. This is one of the more powerful things why I think protective services needs to be involved. And this is the time, you know, did you notice that every single one of these kids said that they had been bullied? Mm -hmm. So this is the time I go to the audience and say, in your own personal life, within one degree of separation, meaning you, someone in your family, maybe your cousins, or somebody in your acquired or adopted family, have you had experiences with bullying? Because I have. And when I do these presentations, anywhere from two-thirds to three-fourths of the audience says yes. So this is just unofficially a very per pervasive problem. So did somebody else have something they wanted to say? Okay, I have two people over here wanting to make a comment. Yeah, it's just, um, it was interesting. Quite a few of the kids identified that the person doing the bullying felt more important. So it's a, it's a process of they're identifying that they're, the bullier is being empowered. Yes. So maybe part of it is t helping kids feel powerful and empowered without having to resort to bullying. And some of the more effective intervention programs have peer-to-peer -peer contact and peer-to-peer -peer feedback for stopping it, as some of the girls on the tape talked about. And you had a comment you wanted to make. I found it really interesting that uh, several of them mentioned the consequences, that there should be consequences to the behavior so I felt that maybe these kids do understand that there are no consequences. And mm -hmm. as adults, that is part of setting structure and boundaries too. That's very important. So the kids really are very clear. There has to be measured and escalated consequences. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of wisdom in what these kids have to say. So I think they're asking us for help and they've laid out a bit of a plan here for us, for us to follow up. So um, in, Moving from here, there's a lot of fragmentation perils with staying with the concept as it is, because you can see that it ignores the child's perspective here. So if I move a little bit quicker and talk about the scope of the problem, I'll briefly talk about the national, um, second national survey of children's exposure to violence, and this was conducted by the Crimes Against Children Research Center, headed by David Finkelhorst. So, he took um, an actual instrument, an actual survey called the Juvenile Victimization Survey, and the next slide will show you that it actually talks about a lot of things that involve vi uh, video, excuse me, um, bullying, especially this down here, sibling aggression. And there are other things in here that they were, they were asking about. And there's a sample of about 4,500 kids on random dial, so it is, uh, hopefully, applicable to the general population. And for kids that were uh, nine and under, they interviewed the caretaker. And for kids that were over 10, they actually spoke to the kid. So this is the part where I'm gonna fast forward. Um, these are the graphs that talk about victimization uh, type and uh, age distribution. And also that with the number of types of victimizations that a kid experienced, the trauma line, which is that blue line that is going up in the middle, um, as you might imagine, goes up. And in their research, they found that there were quite a few aggravating factors here. And you can see what they are. Some of these incidents actually involved bodily injury, and this is how they defined it. You still were sore the next day. You got a hurt, you bled. A lot of these incidents involved weapons. And some of it wouldn't be considered bullying because it was a one-time event. Um, other aggravating factors here were a use of the internet, which as you heard one of our um, young people describe, it lives on forever. So there are several things here that uh, David Finkelhorn and, and his associates said that, oh, I wanna mention this, the bias component. When kids talk to other kids in a bullying, peer victimization way and talk about their sexual orientation, this has a huge impact on children. Somehow this is a lightning rod for kids to actually feel very bad about the situation and miss school. And we're gonna to get to outcomes in a moment here. So in the recap, 
I'll tell you the recap. The highest uh, numbers of victimizations are in uh, physical assault, verbal aggression, and relational aggression. And relational aggression is stuff like telling lies or gossiping or spreading rumors, the kind of things that hurts your relationship with other people. Um, children, as they're older, they experience more victimization, except for the younger kids. They had a lot of experience with verbal aggression. And with poly victimization comes more trauma symptoms. So outcomes, and this is what we talked about before, missing school. Um, and outcomes are your mean trauma scores for your victimizations, and you'll see here the trauma score is highest when the victimization is around sexual assault. Those are the two columns in the middle. And the child's level of fear, this is a little bit hard to distinguish on your power on your printout there, but um, the, the uh, colleagues, my research colleagues asked, were they a little bit afraid or a lot afraid? And you can see that when the issue was sexual assault, the fear is way over to the, uh, the right-hand side of the graph. So in recap, what is this research telling us? The highest uh, level of missing school was for kids that had experienced sexual assault and sexual harassment. Um, the trauma scores were highest, again, for sexual assault and sexual harassment. And the level of fear, do you see a theme here? Highest for sexual assault and sexual harassment. Um, by, here's the peer victimization and assault by location. So it's actually very interesting. These are the uh, slides on location, but in location recap, um, general assault, about two-thirds of the assaults, guess where they take place? They actually do take place at school. And then the other thing I have here is that flashing takes place on and off of campus, and one of the new elements of peer aggression is showing people your genitals. Who would have thought that that would be an effective way to actually humiliate someone, but you know, in our day, you're trying to keep your underpants covered up, but not so much anymore, okay. Um, cyber and other forms of relational aggression all happen off campus, and that's why the school bias is no longer effective when we're thinking about these concepts of bullying. And all of these uh, experiences of bullying are typically accompanied by a power imbalance, um, and the implications of the research on, on scope is that it doesn't include many of the things um, like for dating violence and one-time incidents, and, and it does not include oftentimes a one-time uh, gang activity. Um, we suggest sh shifting our attention to calling it peer victimization and peer um, aggression because in that way we would all be on the same page and maybe we can use these kinds of instruments that David Finkelhorn and his colleagues used to actually mention, to measure it so that we could all figure out how serious of a problem this really is. So implications of scope. I wanna to move to the next one and say, one of the things we say in our presentation is that even though there may be some recent reduction in bullying, we think we may have gotten to the low hanging fruit that across this country, 10% of high school kids say that they have been physically assaulted, but that is a mean score across the country. Some high schools are as high as 40% of the kids say that they've been physically assaulted. So let me ask you, as adults, would we tolerate that in our workplace? No. Would you have come here today if you thought there was a 10 to 40% chance that you might be physically assaulted today? I don't think so. So the other thing is I want to pose that, you know, these kids are asking us for help because this is what they're facing. And we want to be thinking about that and, um, and think about that this slight downward trend may not continue. So we have to get more sophisticated in our techniques in addressing bullying. And David Finkelhor has called for a focus on developmental victimology, understanding that these kids developing psyches carry a long tail when they experience these kinds of aggravated insults. Oh, and what I want to mention here is that in 2015, just last April, in Lancet Psychiatry, there was a study by Lorea et al., and I'll cut to the chase here. They actually measured kids that experienced uh, child maltreatment only, intrafamilial child maltreatment at the hands of adults and their parents, and measured it against kids who experienced peer aggression and victimization. Guess who had the worst outcomes as adults? 
the kids who had been, quote unquote, the concept of bullying, which we're now calling peer aggression and victimization, those kids as adults had higher rates of anxiety, depression, and self-harm than the kids that had experienced maltreatment only. Is that the news flash that some of you may have seen in the LA Times in April? So they did publish it. It made it to the main press, to the mainline press, but not everybody picked up on it. I saw a slight story on it in National Public Radio. So these are the folks, these are the researchers that are now saying the long-term impact of peer aggression and violence is more severe in terms of a worse mental health outcome when these youngsters become adults. So I guess I want to ask you this question. Can we afford to have these youngsters come into their adulthood with high levels of anxiety, high levels of depression, and high levels of uh, self-harm? I don't know that we can. So let me go um, to the conclusion here. Um, arguments for inclusion. And we have some precedent for doing this. You know, when uh, Kemp published the Battered Child Study, an article, you know, that turned around a whole nation from looking at child accidental injuries to really looking at what is a purposeful injury here and what does this mean? We also have experience with uh, child sexual abuse and turning that around from first discovering it when people brought their kids to shelters. In 2016, we have a feature film that's up for the Academy Award that is focused on child sexual abuse and the interventions surrounding that. Does everybody know that? Spotlight. Who would have thunk that that many years later, you know, it would have entered the mainstream? And we really have developed the Child Advocacy Center concept. So there's much that we can do about taking something like this, the kernel, and bringing it into the mainstream and saying, we need to do something differently. My next slide you can look at later about how bullying and child maltreatment are, actually have a lot of the same impact. The implications for making a shift, very important. I think we need to shift to this concept so that we're all on the same page of understanding what this is, the seriousness with which kids regard it, and so that researchers can actually conceptualize and measure it and go to policy divisors and say, we need to do something a bit more aggressive about this. And one of the things we're talking about is maybe we should enable schools to report it. Because as you heard the kids say, when we talk about bully prevention programs, they are effective when parents are involved. The paradox, as I said earlier, is bully parents don't think there's a problem. What, my kid? And some of us think that one of the reasons why they don't want to get involved is perhaps their kid is also experiencing some form of child maltreatment at home. Like you heard one of our child geniuses say, you got a problem? Solve it. It's your problem. So some of these kids that are bullying other kids, we might surmise, are experiencing some form of maltreatment. And what bully parent wants to come in and face that? So I really think we ought to have a channel for schools to go to the Department of Children and Family Services, generically CPS, even law enforcement, to be able to say, you know, if you cooperate with the school for 30, 60, 90, 120 days, we won't open a case. Almost like an alternative response that DCFS has the capacity to do. And that way we need leverage with the parents to be able to get them to realize the seriousness of the situation, perhaps see that if they cooperate, they won't have a full-blown case, and to put pressure on their own children to be able to uh, change their behavior. That's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it involves you going to your schools and asking, does your school have an active anti-bullying program? What do they do to enforce it? And then some schools will give you and some will be right on top of it. So it's a, there's a wide variety, there's a spectrum of responses. But I would ask you to ask your schools to show you their absenteeism rate. To actually ask you know, the schools if they have done an anonymous survey, truly anonymous, about what's going on. So the kids like these kids could actually speak up and say what their experience has been. So with that, I know it's 9.30 and I want to bring this to uh, a close and maybe have a minute for a question or two, but I want to thank you for your time and attention to this and for actually sitting and thinking 
how could we change this concept formerly known as bullying, like Prince, into something else? Could we call it peer victimization and aggression? Could we get on the same page so that we could measure it more effectively? Could we get on the same page with understanding how children see this so, so seriously? And could we step up to our role as adults, caretaking and caregiving adults, to really step in, give kids the tools they need by actually making the parents accountable, the parents of the aggressors accountable, and also giving schools additional tools they need to monitor the situation and bring children into what we need to do to make these kids accountable. Thank you so much for paying attention. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, a comment from back there? Yeah. I love it. Uh, there's a, actually a judge in uh, Los Angeles County. He's the former David, it's first Judge David, he's the former Nash. presiding judge. No, yeah. it's not Michael Nash. It's, um, he's a presiding judge of the whole. He was, he just recently stepped down. But he's got a restorative justice approach in four high schools in Los Angeles, and it is working. They're bringing kids in and they have a jury of peers. It's a restorative justice approach, and they're listening to kids' stories, and then they're making a plan that the kids have to abide by. David, do I want to say Wexler? Does anybody know his name? I'll look it up and I'll get back to you. But it's very impressive. He actually presented at our uh, juvenile court conference, our uh, Herschel Swinger Memorial Conference, and I actually went to his session and it was quite good. And I think that restorative justice approaches have a lot of potential. Um, but we still, even though that's dealing with peer-to-peer, -peer, we still have to bring in the parents. Thank you. Okay, another comment? Um, what do you think about parents that think that they're better than their children, that they can control them to, like, if they, if they don't do what they say, they physically hurt them? Like, what do you think about that? Like, if them force, it's hard to explain, like, someone that thinks power in a uh, violent way is better way to tell them what to do than being calm? Yeah. What do you... So let me, I, I don't know if the, for the tape purpose I'll say the question was actually about what about parents that role model power? So I think many people in this room would be, you know, converts to not doing that. And so I think that what parents have to model for their kids are negotiation skills, what we sometimes call the non-cognitive skills. But that's easy for me to say. You know, that's perhaps what people in this room might do. So we have to think about when parents don't do that and they're modeling for their kids, you know, might makes right, you can sort of understand how these kids go to school and, and then try to implement that model and it doesn't quite work. So what we have to do is give both the parent and the kids consequences in that. And sometimes the intervention has to be done in a way that is very listening to the parents as well because we can't, we can't in, in that way, we can't force our intervention in a powerful way on the parents. We have to elicit from them and gain their cooperation, which sometimes is very difficult. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I'm wondering about, is, aren't all the things that we all deal with aggression and victimization? And maybe we'd be better dropping the peer and dropping the domestic violence and intimate partner violence and sexual violence and acknowledging that it's all aggression and victimization and that treating it as a, you know, a spectrum, you know, it starts out yeah. perhaps with bullying but ends up being domestic violence, sexual assault, it's all the same behavior. So Paula, that's really brilliant. So let me let me repeat that for the tape. So Paula had an idea that maybe we should just drop drop the word peer and that maybe we're talking about a continuum of behaviors that are all involved in victimization and aggression starting here and ending up, you know, at a criminal level. And I think many of the things that are here with kids and bullying and, and peer victimization, they are crimes. They can be crimes. So maybe we should just talk about the range of victimization and aggression. Okay, I see your hand. Yes, go ahead. What are your thoughts about um, the authority figure being fearful of inter intervening? Where I went to medical school uh, in, uh, in New Orleans, there was definitely schools that we had the opportunity to work at, and there was definitely some uh, 
some some fear amongst teachers saying, you know, this is just, you know, I fear for my own safety that it almost seemed like the teachers were also kind of getting bullied and were being thought as a victim. It's like, this is just not worth, worth it if I don't want to make myself a target. You know, thank you. For the, uh, for the purpose of the tape, what do you think about when you approach a school and the teachers are reluctant, that they're saying, I don't know, I, I fear for my own safety? Well, I think they also, they pay, play such a critical role for the event, for the effective intervention, we have to involve the teachers and we have to involve the parents and we also have to involve the kids. That goes without saying. But when teachers say, this is not worth it for me, I fear for my own safety, that should be a huge alarm for us. So we're sending our kids into that environment where the teacher feels that he or she is unprotected. I think those are the schools that mostly need our intervention then. So we have to say to the teachers, what would it take for you to feel safe in order to do that? I think that's the next question. Do you need more backup? Do you need more staff? Do you need your principal's backup? Because sometimes the people that are powerful in that community, you know, uh, the parents of the kids that are bullies, sometimes they put a lot of pressure on the teachers. I understand it, but it's not okay. Teachers are the backbone of this kind of an intervention because they're on the scene. The kids can't do it alone. They need us adults to step in and help them. And I think you had your hand up before. I wanted yeah, to make I sure. I to go back to something you recently mentioned as far as not forcing um, your own agenda and interventions on the parents. Mm -hmm. Where is the component of taking into consideration the parents when they were victims and having their yes. trauma and experience and getting stuck in that moment and then you know reliving that with their own children? It almost seems as if opening up a CPS, ECFS report would be another consequence reinforcing that you're still not good enough, you're still not a good enough parent, and taking them back to when they were seven or eight getting bullied at school, it's kind of the same cycle. So where, where does that component come in as far as getting them the help that they need to be able to establish a solid foundation and then become an effective parent for their child as opposed to another consequence and getting an open CPS case? Okay, so to summarize is what happens if the parent has also been traumatized and maybe perhaps opening a CPS case might traumatize them even further. Did I summarize it accurately enough for, for the tape here? And I think that it's possible that the parent was bullied themselves or is in some sort of a power relationship with their child for some sort of an adverse reason. So I think that's why we have to role model listening for them. We have to understand the continuum of trauma. We have to allow them to talk about it. But sometimes we do need an authoritative intervention. And sometimes I think this could be offered to parents as a deal. You know, if you cooperate with the intervention program at the school, then a case will not be open. Sort of an, what we might call an alternative response on the part of DCFS. Now, if they don't cooperate, then you have a point. A case may be opened, and sometimes a DCFS and Children's Protective Services is aware of their own capacity to cause trauma. But sometimes the issue is you have to have an authoritative intervention to get people to cooperate. We first offer, them to, offer it to them on a cooperative basis, and if they choose not to, then we have to see what we can do that actually has leverage. Okay. One more comment, and I think it sounds like we're out of time. trying to change the power and control dynamics, but that feels very much like we're imposing more power and control on this family system. So to say, like, well, if you cooperate, then nothing will happen. That's still a threat. I don't know how open people would be to have that conversation. And if you look at things in like a trauma-informed care way, it's looking at like, you know, why is this happening to you? Like, what's going on? Where is this coming from? Versus like having someone have to be defensive or not assume that a parent wouldn't feel judged that really mm -hmm. would help any way. Like it just feels very that we're then inserting our own power and control over another system. And if you bring in police, increasing the number of cases that can eventually go to like juvenile hall and the that has, that been that has on them, I don't see that yeah. you know that's in my prior <clears throat> work. I don't see that as functioning in terms of helping somebody change their behavior. So the question is, is um, what I'm proposing a little more authoritative and is it just replicating, you know, that um, we're bullying the parents, you know, sort of maybe, I'm just summarizing that. Is, that. is that possible? I think you have a valid point there. So, but here's the issue. The issue is, is that bully parents by and large do not want to cooperate. 
And it, if we're gonna stop it, we need the parents to be vigilant about what their kids are doing because it's happening two places. It's happening at school, which is why we need the teachers and the teacher's aides to be vigilant and be willing to intervene. And the second thing is we need somebody at home to intervene with the handheld devices. And if that's not happening, it's really hard to stop it. So I think you have a really good point. I think the approach would be to interview them and try to make an alliance with them on a voluntary basis and ask them to cooperate. And then if it didn't work, this would be almost plan B. Plan A is to try to get them in and cooperating, and B would be, okay, if that didn't work, we have to move to something else. And then B, I hope, would be an alternative response where they would be allowed some time to try to change their behavior with the school. And then only if that didn't work, then a case would be in, in opened. So I think it gives them some options and some space to move in, even though I hear your point that sometimes when you move with an authoritative intervention like this, sometimes you don't always have success. What other things? Okay, you know, it's time and I appreciate that you stayed extra. Thank you very much for considering it and I hope that you'll weave this into your work and think about how victimization, maybe we'll remove the word peer, victimization and aggression is part of what we all do. Thank you very much. <laughs>